Okay, so good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone from wherever you are. Uh, my name is Maria. I'm the founder of VLA Global. And today we have a special webinar with guests um, that we're going to be doing. And um, I just want to give a brief background of the reason as to why we're do doing this. So a uh, couple of us, youth-led organizations, decided to start a series which is basically focused on finance and carbon pricing and it's going to be six different sessions and so for today for this session this very first session we are going to be focusing on driving uh, climate finance after COVID-19 as you all are aware we are all dealing with the uh, different um, adjustments that we've had to do during this um, very trying period but also trying to continue our work in the climate and environmental space. So with that, I will hand over to Dolphin to take over. Hi, my name is Dolphin from Kenya. Uh, we are co-hosting this initiative with my counterpart, Maria, from BLI Global. Uh, I am from the African Youth Initiative for Climate Change. Uh, apart from that, I also have a couple of other youth networks and other networks in Kenya that we run that deal with climate change. So today, the purpose of this focus, uh, focus of this discussion basically is to reevaluate where we are in terms of the recent COVID-19, in, in, in terms of the recent COVID-19 crisis and how it relates to climate finance. So just to give a brief background, uh, even before, before the 25th Conference of Parties that happened uh, in, in Madrid, uh, the status of climate finance was not so much defined because we, we could see that uh, the countries were still trying to, 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 to find a balance between, between providing finances for the developed countries from for the developing countries rather in most developed countries. So basically, uh, as of as of as of like the the recent uh, the recent negotiations of climate change, there are bit some gaps that need to be filled. So the purpose of this of this of this webinar basically is to highlight basically where do we stand as young people and in terms of climate financing, what are our chances given given basically the recent events with COVID nineteen. So with that, I will I, I would like to reevaluate that at the 24th Conference of Parties, when we follow discussion on long-term finance, there was a lot of back and forth between parties, basically the developed and the developed countries on, on, on issues of, of basically whether or not we should continue with issues of, of long-term mobilizing resources post-2020. So these are some of the key sticky issues that, that should worry us given that COVID-19 has affected of course, of course, issues of climate change and the negotiations, because we saw basically the Africa Week on climate change uh, was actually was actually postponed to a later date, and a couple of other things have moved around. So we're looking to, to put into perspective all these global uh, initiatives and how the COVID-19 has affected them and how it relates to providing resources for the young people, especially from the developed countries like Africa and Asia. So I think with that, uh, we, I will hand over to my counterpart, Maria. Yes. Thank you, um, introduction. Um, and so without further ado, I would like to uh, ask Diane to come on board and, and introduce herself and how her work relates to climate change. And then we can also ask Dr. Dugel to come on board and do the same. Perfect, cool, thanks so much. Um, so my name is Diane. Um, and I'm the co-founder of Madvest. I'm talking to you from Belgium today in Europe. Um, and I've been a, a lot focusing on what as we can we as customers do to have our money contribute to climate change and not the opposite. Um, so maybe I can share my screen to do my presentation. Is that okay, Maria or Dolphin? Yeah. Yes, that's fine. Uh, share screen. 
away. Perfect, cool. So normally you can see my screen um, and you can see a lot of euros there uh, because I'm going to talk to you about the initiative My Money, My Planet. Um, and so basically, a bit a brief uh, note about Metavest. So Metavest, um, with Metavest, we are using technology to help you plan, learn, and save and spend sustainably. Um, so using leading technology for to power sustainable finance as a user perspective. And what we do is we do a lot of webinars, events, workshops to really um, in, increase that awareness on sustainable finance and then on the need to do that link between money and climate change. And so what I realized during doing all of these workshops and events is that a lot of people are talking about climate change and are going to the Fridays for Future strike, are trying to reduce trends in a lot of ways, but they rarely think of money as a potential leverage to, um, to really solve that, that crisis that we're facing. Um, and so that's what we want to highlight. And I'm going to take an example of in 2019, um, you've almost, um, I'm sure you've heard of it, but there was a huge Amazon forest fire. And the devastating part of it was that it was not the biggest by size, but it was actually human led. So it was caused by companies who were deforesting um, the Amazon and that led to a fire. And what we saw post this huge fire is that a lot of companies which were actually in um, causing that fire were um, being supported by major financial institutions, major European banks um, and financial institutions like Black, BlackRock, et cetera. And so that that shows you that within with your money, even though you cannot see it, your money can really have an impact on the planet. Um, and so when we look at both sides, right, you are on the street, you are organizing this webinar, uh, really, like just it can be simple as that. And you're actually looking, uh, watching this webinar to see how you can make a change. And then on the opposite side, you have your money, which is invested by banks, insurance companies, pension funds, and that money, you don't know where it's going. And for most of it, that money is invested in things that you don't want to be part of. So it can be weapons, pollutions, tobacco, etc. And so what we found out is that, yes, people do not um, talk about it because also money is a bit of taboo to talk about. Um, but when you look at um, a, a study that a Swedish bank has done, which is Nordea, um, they found out that for a Swedish average person, um, their savings can have up to 27 times more impact than their sustainable, uh, sustainable consumption. So that does not mean that what you do on the consumption side of sustainability does not matter, but it means that you also need to look at your money to, to have that change that you really want to see in this world today. Um, and yes, change is possible. It might be it might be very um, abstract what I'm telling you today, but we've seen that a U.S.-based um, pension fund has changed the way that they do their investments uh, because ten of their customers called them to ask how sustainable their money was. Um, so so that is really like a way that. I, I really think and do believe that money can change what we, what, um, how, how it works. Um, and then I just wanted to show this slide because I, on one side, am an activist. Uh, I'm here on this webinar. Um, I'm, um, and I want my money to really be in the left side of things, like really nature, renewable energies, et cetera. But my bank might be invested in the 
um, right things or things. So drilling, forest fires, etc. And so that's where I started the campaign called My Money, My Planet. And with My Money, My Planet, we invited people to do two things. First, um, have a social media presence, because what we believe is that banks and money is not talked about enough. And so we wanted people to basically take a photo of of them with their bank card and their bank details and ask their bank and tag their bank what their to ask them to ask the bank what their money was go, was doing and then second is a manifesto and that's basically a letter that we sent to a bank um and so if you sign that manifesto on our website which is mymoneymyplanet.com um, we will automatically send a letter to your bank to ask where your money is going. So we really wanted to have that action part and reach out to the banks. Um, and so this is where this campaign led us. And this campaign is still ongoing. So please do take part. Um, the more people we have, uh, the more um, the more this will help will have an impact but um and as you can see a lot of t people took part in the campaign um you can i mean and and we as a result we already had two banks calling us so that that they would they wanted to talk to us about the way that they were dealing uh with the consumer's money because we sent over 180 letters and that it that number is increased day by day um, and I think banks were Dan we can't hear you hello Diane Diane Okay, she seems to be having a problem with her with her audio. Um, let's see. Diane, can you hear us? Yeah, she Diane. seems to be having a problem with her audio. But I think uh, okay, she's, she's probably going to come back on. So I, I but I think uh, based on what you said, I really like what she's doing because she's uh, trying to hold banks accountable with young people and getting them to, you know, um, speak to their banks and sign this petition um, about investing in, in a greener future. I'm hoping she can come back so she can finish that presentation. But I also wanted to mention the reason why we invited her was because of what she's doing um with the project and how she's trying to uh innovate and change the way that banks think then i'm not sure if you can hear us but we lost you at the beginning hello diane hello can you hear me yeah sorry my internet is not uh, my internet did not cope great you can proceed with the, with your presentation. You can go on with the presentation then. Uh, so okay, so I'm sorry for this. Um, I hope this, this goes until the end of my presentation, at least, and then, okay, so, um, I, I don't know where you lost me, um, because, so, I don't know if you saw this, but a lot of people took part in the, in the, in the campaign, and we actually are now having two bank meetings um and we're going to discuss with them um 
how they invest and what they can do to integrate more the user's point of view and sustainability within their investment strategy. So, and that is a result uh, of um, so many, um, so many, um, so many bank letters that we sent and so many people that, um, that, that tagged us on social media and that signed the manifesto. And what we're doing right now is because we've sent 180 uh, bank letters and please do, do sign the manifesto so we'll have more data um, to rank the banks. But basically what we're doing is we're ranking the banks according to their transparency. So we want to show the customers that yes, um, you need to understand where your money is going. Um, and that is where we'll be uh, able to tell you throughout the answers that we get from the banks. This bank is five, uh, has a score of five on transparency. And so that's what we really want to show the user that your bank can, can play a role. Hello, Dan. All your money can play a role, and your money has a link to sustain. To see you, you, to show you this slide, which is the last one, because I really, we really want to make my money, my planet, a campaign where people take more attention to what money, what is the link with within money and sustainability, and I can share the website, all the information. And on, is on the website uh, after on the chat, but um, and so yeah, so that's that's what we are trying to do. And I'll just leave you guys with a quote at the end, which is, oh yeah, just take action, sign the manifesto, or subscribe on the website to know more. But I just wanted to leave you with a quote, which is, today finance rules the world, and so I believe that we can really change. the rules for the better um, of our planet and our so yeah cool so I I'm the Yes, Dan, sorry, we didn't hear the last, what you last said, but I, I would like for you to stay on a bit longer because we, we have a couple of questions for you on the presentation. Um, however, I would like to hand over to Dolphin to introduce uh, yes. Dr. Jibril. Uh, so uh, our next speaker in session is Dr. Jibril. Jobril, uh, maybe you would like to inform our viewers and our listeners a bit uh, what you do. Uh, first of all, we know that you're from Nigeria, so I'm hoping all is well uh, with Nigeria, even in the midst of COVID-19. Uh, so kindly, if, if you don't mind, if you could highlight what you do in, and how it relates to climate change, we'd really, be, we'd really love to know you better through what you do and how basically it relates to climate change and climate financing aspects. Yes. Uh, doc, we can't seem to get you clearly. Maybe we, yes. Could you try again, please? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Hi, Jibril. My name is Jibril from Nigeria. Uh, believe us. And I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I work for a company called SME Funds Capital. Uh, based from based in Nigeria, and we engage largely uh, in impact investments that has uh, an underlay of climate impact as well as social impact. And we've been doing that for the past uh, 12 years now. You know, and we've got our investment portfolio varies from ranges from renewable energy to energy efficiency to sustainable 
I think that's uh, going to energy. So maybe that's what we've done over the years. Um, moving into the subject of today's uh, conversation, uh, I really like what Diane said about finance rules of all the world. Absolutely. You know, at the end of the day, after everything is said, the key question is that how do we get capital or how do we get finance to get it, to get it done? People that, people that get paid and you know and everything involves a lot of money, basically. But the first the first thing I would like to start with is that first of all we need to ensure that we clarify what climate finance or climate action means. Because for the past few years now there's been a lot of misconception and people thinking that climate action and climate finance is something that is completely difficult to start, it's difficult to adapt, but it's very it's not the same thing. So the first thing we have to understand is that that two sides to climate climate finance. One is on the side of mitigation by reducing the causes of climate of climate change. And that cause is majorly the green gas, the green out gases, CO2 emission and methane. So any activity, maybe any climate action, any action we have back on that is going to reduce that cause, that is the climate action, that is climate finance, and that is that is, is as simple as that. Okay, so Climate finance doesn't mean we need to create a new industry or create a new sector. No. It's the same sector that climate finance or climate action is focusing on is just to decarbonize, to decarbonize those sectors and industries. That is what it's about. The other part of climate finance is the adaptation. We talked about, yes, we are we've been very late to to propagate and to uh, to administer climate finance for the past, for like over 10 years or 13 years. So a lot of the um, devastating effects of climate change has caught up with us. We have drought, we have um, flood, we have um, heat wave, we have all these things happening. So what can we quickly do so that we can adapt or cope with the effect of all this climate change while we still sustain our businesses, our livelihood, and as well as our well-being? So that is what climate adaptation is about. So, for example, if a business was going into uh, was, into, was going to venture into a project or a climate action where they are producing tomatoes or vegetables without relying on the soil where there's drought or where there's no rain, you know that is what we call climate action and climate finance. So, so that's what I would say. And uh, from experiences. Post-COVID and you know, pre-COVID, we've not done much about climate finance. There's been a lot of um, interesting conversation about the few years. So I work on the conversation center around energy, because like we all know, energy contributes over 25% of the global emissions. Right? So there's a lot of focus on energy. How do we decarbonize energy generation? You know, a lot of times over the past few decades, Decades, we focus so much on carbon, um, coal to generate um, energy. So we're looking at how can we transition and put um, a lot of investment into renewable energy, such as solar, hydro, biomass, wind. So that is what. Uh, we the end of the day, what I always say is that. We are funding energy sector. At the end of the day, it is still the same electricity that is being produced or generated. You know, so the same thing that the same, the same energy that coal or gas or fossil fuels produce, the same market also needs to use electricity. It is the same. So there is nothing really new about it. And for the past ten years, there's a lot of uh, investment that has gone into renewable energy. Um, I think Jibril has um, a bit of. Done, you know, because you know, for the major. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, but it's a bit shaky. We understand uh, it's a bit of network issues with you. Or, yes, we have a bit of but just try to go and increase the volume a bit, your volume from your end a bit, so that we get to hear you louder. Is it better now? Yes, it's better. Just continue, Kendi. Okay, so so I, I just talked about the 
energy sector. So if we move on to energy efficiency, right? So a lot of conversation we've been having over the few years across Africa is how can we encourage um, industries, manufacturing companies, agro processing companies to adopt energy efficiency technology so as to reduce the energy consumption. You know, I know once a company implements energy efficiency, efficiency measures and, and technology, the energy demand reduces, and which is also good for the climate. So, and again, you know, once an industry reduces energy demand, what that means in effect is that the cost of operation for that industry has also come down. So there's, 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 there's there are there are there are actually more commercial benefits. Uh, apologies, uh, Jibril is having a bit of network issues, but I, I, I think uh, there are some key aspects that is really picked up really quite well. There are some key key aspects that is picked up quite well, and so some of those key aspects that I've, I've really liked is the definition of finance. So the, he has really emphasized on the need to define what climate financing it is. And as I can remember from the COP25 negotiations, financing, the definition was still an issue. There's no clear definition of what, what, what actually climate, what defines climate financing is, how we define those borderlines. And that led to a lot of issues about whether loss and damage, how to define loss and damage within issues of climate financing aspect. So I think uh, what, what Jibril was trying to bring out is really, is really important and really powerful, especially in light of where we are as, 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 as of course, I would say as a country, I would say where we are as, as people within the climate change space and people who are concerned about our environment. So it's, this climate financing issue has really come out. So Jabril, would like to see, because I see you sorted out to make a well. If you would like to continue from where we left off, we, we are talking about energy efficiency. And I'd like you to, to go on a bit more about energy efficiency and how to produce it, especially for the industry. Yes. Yeah, sorry, I have a very bad network. I found that issue about COVID with this <laughs> data. So, um, <laughs> on energy. <laughs> so, so I, like I, what I was saying before I went out was that climate action and climate finance actually has more commercial benefits or economic benefits than the environment benefits, actually. But this is not out left to us on how we communicate the benefit of climate action or climate finance. Because I give an example. If an industry typically would need one megawatt of energy to, to operate its factory, but by infusing energy efficiency technology at a particular cost, the energy demand would drop from one megawatt to less than, say, 600 kilowatts. That tells you that the energy cost will drastically drop. And that will also promote productivity in the operations of that particular industry. So, I mean, if we, if we look at the, the other thing we can also look at it to make it simple is that let's list out the, the sectors that contribute to climate change, right? We have energy, we have industries, we have agriculture, we have transportation. All we are just trying to say is that in every of this, anything we want to do, let's ask ourselves is it going to generate or emit carbon? If the answer is yes, then the, the other question will now be, what can we do so that we don't emit carbon or we don't emit this much carbon? That is what climate action, that is what climate finance is really all about. So, and that is the kind of conversation that how we continue to have with people to try to demystify what really is climate finance and what really is climate action. And, and uh, uh, I would like to close also by the fact that we have to probably keep saying that um, the law so population, population population rise. I mean, there will be more people to, there will be more need for outreach. The other thing about climate finance and climate action is that how can we start to do that outreach and that we could bring them start to do that outreach. You know, and there are, there are, there are a lot of international standards that guides how buildings can be built, can be built you know, in line with um, adapt, um, 
comply with the climate um climate um, climate finance standards. So I think I will just stop there and uh, wait for us to talk more than I can check that. Go on. Thank you. Jabril, I, I, like I was saying, those are very good and strong questions of climate change and climate action, and the linkage between climate action and climate finance. I think the main thing we do really need to define what exactly this climate should be, and also be by and unpack what climate finance is. I also like how how you attack the issue of 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 energy efficiency because we know that energy is is energy the fossil uh, fossil fuel energy is one of the main causes of climate change globally because because uh, the way we are going if we don't cut down on energy we we, we might not meet our Paris agreement goal of 2 point of 2 degrees goal and below so i think with that with those very strong points i'd like to hand over to maria to to introduce the next speaker who i am very much confident will will be able to be as elaborative as as you have been jibril thank you now over to maria yeah thank you uh dolphin uh before i go forward i just wanted to share with diane some of the questions they had for her. So the first one, as you can see on the screen, is um, she she wants to understand. He sorry wants to understand further the idea of uh, my money, my planet, and then um, the other question is um, I have interacted with Kenya. I've interacted with the Kenyan Kenyan bank Kenyan banking and insurance sector. Uh, and I think there is a big lacuna in the areas of sustainability, people-centered, and coherent policies that can shape green finance agenda. So I think he wants to understand a little bit more about um, the money matters issue. And also, I had a personal question about your campaign, which is, so when you do that, when the young people get on board to do the campaigns, how does the bank um, share their transparency? Do they share the transparency of their investments? Um, do they include the young people in discussions on this? Or is it just like a top-down approach where the bank issues a statement that they are changing how they're going to invest? OK, those are, those are great questions. Um, so thanks so much, Maria. And um, I forgot the name of the person who asked both questions. So, But uh, great Thank questions. You. and. What I can what I can do is uh, I can I can share with you and um, post this call. I can also um, send you um, a blog post that we are in the process of making, which is not done yet. Um, but what we are doing right now is we are comparing the responses we get from the banks with the overall sustainability ranking of the banks. Um, so we are um, we are seeing that some NGOs um, have done ranking on banking on on the banks on how sustainable they are, and we are comparing the answers that we get with uh, um, those rankings. And what we can see, and I I don't know if you can see my screen um, that I'm sharing, but but. This is the example of Belgium, um, which is the country I am in, um, and you can see that um, and that's very that's that was a funny correlation. But you can see that the more sustainable, and you can you can see it here. But the more sustainable the bank is, the shorter response we will get. And so the the least sustainable the bank is, actually, these banks throw at you some awards they got. Um, some CSR uh, prices, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see that they're actually good in the game of greenwashing, um, which is a bit sad to see. But yeah, that's, uh, that's another issue that we could spend a whole webinar on. Um, but, and, and basically, some of the most sustainable banks that, that, um, that we sent letters to we're actually happy that they were raising the questions the other and i had a call from we have a meeting with the ing and bnp paribas in two weeks um and basically these people just called me and said okay we're fed up like we didn't say it that way but they said we're fed up about uh receiving the letters from our customers can we just talk so that we we 
we show you what our, our approach is. However, within that approach, we need to be careful that they don't come, we don't come to the meeting and say, and then they say, oh, we have this, we have this, we have this. And then we need to really go on the, we need to stay true to ourselves and really demand more transparency and more sustainability overall. Um, and about um, the bank in Kenya, I mean, what we can do is we can always, um, like you can co take contact with me. I'm happy to share my um, email address and details. And um, I can send you the letter that we usually send. Um, and we can even analyze the letter that you receive from the Kenyan bank together so that we see how, how they rank in our ranking. And then we can even have a potential launch of My Money, My Planet to get to put out more pressure to the Kenyan bank uh, itself. So I'm happy to collaborate on that um, if needed. I'm not sure, Maria, if this answers the question. Um, if if uh, there are other questions, I'm also happy to to jump in. Okay. Um, if there are other questions, we shall save them for the end. Um, so I would like to move on to the next speaker, Miss Maureen. Uh, who I know is very well versed with negotiating at COPS with her government. And um, so our question to you really is, how have you been able to navigate um, this whole situation and still continue um, your, your, um, what the work that you do in the climate change space, um, just to also inspire the number of, of young people who might be watching this uh, webinar? Um, so hi everyone. Uh, I'd like first to introduce myself. My name is Maureen. I am a Tanzanian working for the Institute of for Environment and Development Sustainability. I'll address this institute as IDEAS, as a research assistant in the area of climate change. I'm currently in Canada where I recently graduated my first degree in business administration. I also got an opportunity to grasp some studies in international finance administration. I, yeah, I'm one of the people who are actually locked in other countries and I'm yet to go back home right after the lockdown. However, with today, I am very, very pleased to be part of this webinar. At IDS, I have been working both as a research assistant, but also supporting Dr. Richard Muyungi as a member of the Greenhouse Climate Fund, who is also the chair of the board of trustees of IDS. Well, the challenges that I currently see, uh, the challenges in climate change post COVID-19 um, are actually very exciting because uh, if you look at it, they're technically on our side. Because as, as we mentioned before, one of the main objectives for climate finance was to make sure that countries adapt um, to the situation and also mitigate and also uh, in that perspective. So now, as you see with everything that's happening with COVID-19, most countries are forced to actually follow up with such objectives from climate finance because with mitigation and adaptate when we when we grasp it, when we grasp these objectives from climate finance, most countries will be able would have been able to tackle um, COVID-19 way better when it when it comes to um, the way the the way the virus was spreading and how climate played a very big role with the spread of the virus, and from my from my point of view, well, I feel like efforts need to focus on ensuring the momentum for supporting most developing countries and small island states, or even most poor countries in Africa, when when addressing such issues such as extreme weather events and sea level high high sea level rise and also most developed countries and developing countries need to ensure the momentum to implement the PASI agreement and that it does not fade <laughs> did i answer all the questions maria um you answered all but one which is um about how how to continue the momentum during this and this, uh, you know, period of lockdown, um, because a lot of young people are still passionate about continuing to do the negotiations, even though COP has been pushed to next year. 
but they still want to see how can they engage their governments, you know, for youth friendly climate inclusive policies. Well, um, to increase the momentum of uh, adaptation and mitigation, I feel like this is a very good opportunity for most young people all over the world, because they would, they're, they're just, most of us are just at home, like as you see right now, we're just able to do everything from a conference call. So we're, most of us are online, so we're able to raise more awareness through social media, through the internet. So uh, like our mate here, Diane, what she's currently doing with the, um, with the campaigns over the internet i feel like if if you if any young person is currently watching this and feels like maybe they're trying to raise awareness in any aspect of climate change and they have very su good supportive arguments we could always start a campaign online and most of us we're, we are going to see it because I'm, I'm very sure that most of us right now have spent so much time in our cell phones so much time on the internet just doing random research so um well, let's make the most of this moment let's just take um take this time and let's just enjoy while we're all at home right and the good part about all this is that you will be able to actually teach more people compared to meeting in, in meetings because now we're able to cover a lot of people unlike in meetings whereby we're only a number of people so let's enjoy everyone yeah, that's a very nice way to conclude that and also answer that, which I, I totally agree with you. Yeah. I just hope that, because um, what I think one of the challenges we're having is that some of the negotiators who who are much, much older than us sometimes don't have the time to sit down with us and do the negotiations online. Um, but hopefully we can figure out a way to to do that but thank you for for that i think that's very insightful what you said um and so before i hand over to dolphin i just have one question for dr jubril which is that we know that nigeria is one of the biggest economies um biggest countries in the oil and gas production sector and so how are you as your company how are you navigating um that should i a conflict of interest um, focusing on climate action and climate related projects in a country that is a heavy uh, supplier and producer of oil. All right. Thank you so much for that question. I mean, first of all, oil is our primary uh, source of uh, foreign, foreign earnings and reserve. Uh, but what I will also say, remember that uh, particularly on gas, let me let me, let me be on gas. So gas is also classified under clean energy technology, right? Because we believe that is a transition to low carbon economy, and Nigeria is also very heavy. We have a lot of uh, abundant um, um, gas reserve, right? But again, the, the, under the Paris Agreement, you know, we've also committed as a, as a, as a country that we would uh, we would do up to 13,000 megawatts of solar penetration into the into the power mix which is very very good and eliminate gas you know gas flame is something we've been battling for a couple of decades now so we're looking how we commercialize gas that have been fled on the site of the um, various oil companies so, and that means we capture the gas and we change the gas to LPG so that the gas could be used for cooking for the small communities. So, and that's also part of the climate finance that we're talking about. Right? Uh, and, um, you know, it, it's, it's a, like I always say, I like to, be, to say it, it, it's very steps, you know. Uh, that's why when I talk to various actors in the, in the industry, I always say baby steps. The first thing we try to achieve, particularly this year, 2020, is that everybody has that shared understanding that climate change is really a major problem and everybody believes that they have a role to play. Once we can achieve that by 20, uh, 2020, uh, for me, that's a very good achievement. Then from 2021, can I start with actual action and impact? Japan is having, oh, okay. That was quite. Uh, Did you hear me? 
yes we towards the end we couldn't hear you properly maybe if you could repeat just a bit towards the end because it, i think it's 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 the covid affecting the the internet in africa and to and to assume <laughs> so what, what i was saying in closing was that if we can achieve shared understanding by all the actors and when i say the actors i mean the industries the banks that are supposed to fund, provide money, the people, the young people, we all understand that climate change is a major challenge, is an existential threat to humanity. You know, I all understand the role that every single one of us needs to play, you know, to ensure that we achieve the Paris Agreement by 2030. Then I would say to everybody, we've done a very good job to so have that shared understanding. Then by 2021, you not expect a lot of uh, rapid implementation of certain climate actions and projects that will now enable us to achieve those goals. The first thing we should try and focus on doing so well now is to have that shared understanding that climate change is an essential to humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jabril. That was really insightful, and it's 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 really quite impressive what 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 is possible uh, at this time and moment. Uh, I'd like to jump into our last but not least, our speaker, Dr. Eduardo Fakasi. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping I've pronounced it correctly. So, Eduardo, I know uh, I know you from Climate Interactive and the World Climate Simulation Exercise. But another interesting fact is that you have been a lecturer at a university, which I'll give you a, the chance to 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 tell us more about. And also, I know that you won the 2016 Climate Collab MIT competition. So, I'd like you to tell us more about that. And in addition, what more you do? and how it relates to climate change and climate financing in general. So Eduardo, uh, kindly please take the floor. We are really looking forward to, to what you have to say. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for letting me talk and inviting me to this conference. Do you hear me well? Is everything's okay? Thank you. Well, uh, first I will say that I was very much impressed by Diane's presentation and I looked up in in, in the internet to, <laughs> and I will check my back account and, um, and other things that I have, in, another investments, whether they're sustainable or not. And that's the, this is the first time I, I, I thought about it. So thank you so much. <laughs> and the second thing I, I want to say, yes, we won the competition in 2016. It was an idea by a 19 year old girl. She studies uh, bioengineering. Now she's uh, 24, I think. She's about to graduate. Um, the idea was very simple. It was just um, the, she saw her parents sleeping in a hotel and temperature was, uh, the air conditioner was set at 18 degrees. And she, she, she saw that the, the her parents were cold, they, they were shivering. So <laughs> she thought, why don't you set the temperature to 22 and, and you will go into west less energy? Well, we studied the proposal and I made a very detailed uh, presentation and uh, we, we recommended to set the temperature at 25 degrees. We won the competition. We didn't expect to win a, a competition by, um, by MIT. But we won. <laughs> and the issue is that the, here in Argentina, where I live, the president saw that by doing that, you reduce the bill, the electricity bill, by 14%. So uh, in Argentina, the elect, uh, electricity is subsidized by the government. So the government pays. That's the main point. The key point is that the government pays. So, uh, so we can save money. <laughs> we, we can save money and, and, and well they started the campaign and it still runs up to day after five years and people uh, have this idea in mind and uh, uh, we had blackouts and they diminished and the duration of these blackouts diminished so we're very proud of this small accomplishment <laughs> we wanted to spread it all worldwide but, but we couldn't uh, do that perhaps you could and uh, about climate finance, I'm very much interested. It's a very big uh, leverage point. I would like to share my screen just one minute. Uh, can I? Can I share my screen? Okay, I, I will share my screen.
Well, uh, do you see this uh, simulator? This is a simulator by Time Match Interactive. I'm working since uh, 2016, the, sorry, 2013 with them. And this uh, simulator shows the, the uh, world energy matrix. And there you have on the right screen, you have on the right screen. Eduardo, just yeah. a second, we can't see screen so if you could just uh share it again thank you it i'm doing that okay now you now you, you can see it now do yes. you do you see the screen i can't see it not yet you cannot no no you cannot i will try uh, now do you see it do, do you see simulator uh we, it has come and then it has gone back again. So you could just press the button. What you've just done, just do it again. Yeah. Yes, 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 there. It's come. Yes, yes. Yes. Well, here and on the left side, you have the global energy matrix. And on the right, you have temperature change uh, through the 21st century. And there is a graph. You, you can change. For, for example, you can set up carbon price. And you see that it has a huge impact and the temperature goes down. Uh, you can repeat this change if you want to. But the issue I, I want to show you is about finance. It, it does have here the financials graph and you can go and revenue and cost from taxes and subsidies. So you, you're really into what how, how we can finance the transformation from a fossil fuel by based uh, energy matrix to a more uh, sustainable matrix. And if you have a high, very high carbon price, perhaps you can finance uh, uh, energy transportation efficiency. And it doesn't really affect the, we have a superavit. We have more money than from taxes then, because energy efficiency uh, repeats the, the story about the climate collapse competition. It generates money. The, cover, the government <laughs> was very happy and we were received by the president it's himself. Uh, the other thing is if you want to do carbon removal, perhaps with these taxes, you can uh, set up machines and you see there is uh, the cost of subsidies uh, it stays the same, and perhaps if you want to do electrification, we don't have much change, but if you subsidize renewables, then we have, well, here the line, the blue line, which is uh, rene renewable uh, revenue minus cost, goes down, the revenue from uh, taxes is the gray line, and the uh, other line, the, the plum line, uh, uh, goes up. So you, this is a, a way you can see in the simulator how can uh, some subsidies, for example, for re renewables, uh, uh, energy efficiency, electrification, uh, carbon uh, removal can be implemented in the long run. Well, uh, that's all what I, what I have to say. I don't know if you have questions for me. I will stop uh, sharing my screen. And if you have questions or you want to know anything else, please uh, write to me. I will leave here my, my email. This is a, the email for the university that where I teach. Uh, Eduardo, uh, that's all. <laughs> Eduardo, uh, we'd request that you stay in for we, we request that you stay in for 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 a few more minutes because we have some few questions lined up and I'm sure our audience watching would like to know more about what you do and especially about the software that you've just shown us. On a personal note and for self development purposes, I've seen I've seen your software and it's called Androids. I've seen it. So Android simulation. What is Android's in full? Basically, if you could elaborate that, and and it it feels like it is it is a form of capacity building, almost a technology or software, or maybe some sort of our for 
purposes of awareness creation could you could you please uh if you don't mind you, you could just uh inform us this software with with which type of audience should, should we use it especially in relation to issues of climate finance so if you could just elaborate more on that uh we'd really appreciate that okay thank you so much well i now doing my report to climate interactive and in the last year since june 2019 i've done 74 simulations uh, they last two two three hours and well uh, i have used it with secondary school students so you can use this with the secondary school students you can use it with uh, engineering undergrad students as I've, i have done and for also for the general public if uh, um, it's easy, really easy. We, we, then they're very uh, interactive games where people say, well, what happens if we do this? What happens if we do that? And we, we change this. And so uh, the purpose of this is that you build your own uh, plan to solve the climate crisis. And that makes you think about uh, globally. So you think about the whole world, and then you can act as perhaps uh, Diane says. I have never thought about that. I, I will check this afternoon where where my money is invested. Uh, I'm sorry for that. I didn't. I didn't I just didn't think about it. Um, and well, uh, this year we did 12 simulations uh, for all Spanish speak, speaking people. Um, uh, about 170 people, 70 people participated. So it's a it's, it can it's a game that it can be played for for any person that is been uh, 15 years up or and who has completed the secondary school. In general, we have big big uh, a great interaction, and people open their eyes and start thinking and see the urgency of all this thing. Uh, uh, any other question? Yeah, I have a question. I have a, I have a question, Eduardo, because I, I, I think I have seen your simulator here in the States uh, when we were doing a lobbying session with Citizen Climate Lobbying. I wanted to ask you, so you've done this with uh, MIT, is that correct? In conjunction with MIT, right? Well, I, I did a short one-week course on uh, system dynamics in 2005 and i knew professor sterman and when he spoke in 2012 in uh, and uh, he, there was a conference in buenos aires and and he was the main speaker and i saw what he said and i thought this is my professor and he's saying that the, we have a climate crisis and i asked i raised my hand and said what are we going to do about this? And they say, you take care, you take care of this. <laughs> so I translated everything to, to Spanish and I start doing simulations. And then I, I found several um, problems or minor issues, really minor issues uh, about, and, and we send our suggestions for improvements and we start working with the climate interactive team and finally, our, 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 our ideas were published in a paper with uh, Juliette Ronnie Varga from U the University of Massachusetts and uh, Joseph Sterman himself as the second author, and what, I was the third one. <laughs> I never expected something like that in my life. I, must, I am not a PhD, I'm just an engineer, um, but the idea was good and they published it and it's published in PLOS One. Uh, that that is my connection to MIT, uh, and uh, well, that's all to you. <laughs> it's something fantastic. Uh, I, I would have never believed I would be doing something like that in my life, <laughs> but I did. So, so any other question uh, that I might help? Uh, uh, I think I thank you really so much to be able to be to be with you, and I, I met Dolphin in in COP uh, in the COP in, in, in Poland, Katowice, 
uh, and I wasn't able to walk. I was using a wheelchair and we spoke a little and uh, we were trying to do some things together. And, uh, and really, I now a member of ECHOS too, as she is. So uh, I'm trying to help and doing simulations in Spanish speaking pe pe uh, countries. Okay, uh, thank you for that elaborate uh, oh elaborate explanation of what you do it's really impressive on on basically uh how how your software can be used as a tool to sensitize uh i, I look at it in terms of the local communities and the youths and basically all stakeholders and basically capacity build them on issues of finance and carbon pricing aspects so i think uh this android is a software that that it's something that we, we we should really be looking to adopt and and something that we, we can really look to help us drive the climate action uh going forward so i think for the next part of the session uh we we at the hand over to maria so that we can quickly move into uh some brief short questions uh maria Okay, yes, so we have one question from Amy again. I, um, I'm not sure if all the speakers can see it. Um, and the question is, we all know negotiations at COPs don't stop Africa anymore. And if they do, the bureaucracies at the Adaptation Fund appear to be deliberately created. What are some of the best alternatives for Africa? Um, does anyone want to jump in and answer that? Maybe Maureen, perhaps, if you would like to say something. Um, well, I don't. I don't think the term general, the generalizing term that you use there, it doesn't cover Africa, is a um, is a good word to use it. Well, I feel like all the meetings that have been held with different countries together. We're all aiming at implementing it. Um, it's not that they don't favor Africa or anything. It's just that, let's say, um, the issues in Africa are seen at a very slower pace compared to other developed countries. For example, in Tanzania, where um, we, uh, we learned the past five years is when we started the carbon dioxide emission project of cut one tree, plant five trees, Katam Tipanda Miti. Well, uh, so uh, if let's uh, in most develop developing countries, these are not issues that are, that will be put out there, that will be spoken about. So I feel like most people are just not aware of it. But this uh, most of these meetings actually do favor developing countries, mostly in Africa. It's just that the pace that we're going with it is not the pace that most us Africans are expecting. The results or we expect the results immediately like in most developed countries but since we're more dependent on funds and we're still negotiating on some matters so our pace of having some some things implemented implemented is at a very slower pace does that answer the question yes yeah and actually, I, I agree with, with, with what Maureen is saying. Uh, looking of, of it from, from, from where I stand or where I sit, uh, I can speak for a case of Kenya. I think Kenya is a country we're really doing well in terms of uh, climate finance resources, in, especially in relation to adaptation fund, because I know Kenya is one of the countries that received first countries, among the first countries that received the adaptation fund. And I think the gap in Africa, I don't know, maybe Jibril can, can shed more light. I, I feel like from where I sit, the gap in Africa Africa is how to mobilize climate financing for the African continent as a package because we we have global finance flows which which are mobilized at the global level and so basically from where I look at it it's like a global basket of resources but in in my personal opinion I feel like uh, we need like another African basket like the African climate change fund basket and I've seen I, I know AFWB is working around it from some discussions we are with in 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 Zanzibar earlier this year so I feel where where we should drive towards is we should move together as Africa to push for maybe an Africa climate change fund I think it's something FGB should be working towards or is already working towards. So, Jibril, I could push this thing over to you because, yes, and also, <laughs> we could talk more about Yeah, that's, that's fine. 
Yes. Yeah, that's fine. Just very briefly, a very, very good point, Maureen. Uh, so, uh, for example, after the Open Bank, they've actually been doing a lot of amazing work for the past um, seven years, right? They have about six, five to six climate impact funds that are just focused largely on adaptation. And these funds get contributions from the developed nations and developed um, financial institutions, right? So I also, I'm also aware that the AFDB is also working on issuing a lot of bonds, they call it green bonds, that they can receive and they can use that money in partnering with several local commercial banks across Africa, right? And why they're doing so, they're also part of the process where they're also building the capacity of the commercial banks to understand that climate finance, climate action is not complex. It's the same thing, you know. So as to be able to get that participation at that um, fast pace, you, you know. And just to quickly respond to the question on the negotiation, I think we or without the Paris Agreement and the negotiations, climate change is a major challenge, a major issue, and we all should understand that. And we don't need to wait for one negotiation to be corrected, perfected, before we know that we need to do things differently. So that is how I always try to try drive the conversation. Let us try as much as possible to simplify the conversation around climate change, climate action, with or without the Paris Agreement. We need to work together to decarbonize the entire global economy because in the next 10 years, it will be a different subject if we're afraid to do so, and we waste a lot of time discussing other issues that are actually delaying the implementation. Thank you. I, I totally agree. I think that's a very powerful way to say it. And, and, and I think also testament is the fact that there are very many grassroots-led organizations out there already uh, doing a lot of climate-related work, even though they, some of them don't even get the opportunity to go to the COPS. So really the COPS, is, it's more about like the policy understanding the policy and negotiating for good policies, but you have to tie it to the action on the ground. Otherwise you're having policies and there is no, uh, there's no implement, it doesn't translate into anything that's going to benefit the environment. And that's also one of the reasons we started this webinar is because a lot of us get so caught up in the policy aspect of it that we forget that, okay, this has to turn into something that's going to you know, benefit the communities. So um, so we, we are doing this because we also want the young people to understand that it's not just about negotiating policies, but also what are you doing at home, at the local level, at the national level, and kind of shedding light on those who are already doing it so others can get like a best practices and learn from um, the other young people who are doing things like Diane and Maureen, for example. Yeah. Maria, I, th I think th those, those are very, th those are very great, great points. And, and, and I think where we are, I, I don't need to talk much about Kenya as a country, but I, I feel I have to, because I, I feel we, we are headed towards, we're dri driving towards more of local action and climate change. We are driving discussions. We are moving it from the national discussions to the local actions. Like for, for Kenya as a country, we, we, we set up the National Climate Change Fund. Uh, back in yes way back then but right now where, where we're driving we've seen the sub-national levels because in kenya we have 47 counties so basically where, where we are headed to kenya as a country we have the the county climate change fund so each county has their budget and a percentage of that budget like some count counties we have counties like mandera uh not mandera counties like makweni and wajir they have set aside part and parcel of their of their budget to go to issues of climate change. Like Makweni has set aside, uh, set aside one percent of its mm -hmm. budget of, of that sub. It is it is like a sub national level to go to issues of climate change. So I think for us, we are slowly shifting away from this issue of dependency 
uh, on resources, not completely from the from the international space. And we're also looking on issues of co-financing. How can we supplement the resources, especially in this time of COVID-19, where resources might be scarce because a lot of it went to addressing issues of COVID-19. How can we co-finance from our own national budgets? Because I know a percentage of the bu national budget should go to climate financing issues in Kenya and right now we're moving to the counties and I, I know also the Kenyan government is so moving towards moving this finance now from the county level that's a sub-national level to the grassroots level so that we, we stop we stop we stop looking at so much at the international community so whatever we we can negotiate for our negotiators can can get from, from the international community this national discussion only comes in to supplement what we're already doing as a country and i think this is a framework that can work uh, across the globe because issues of climate change it affects the grassroots communities more and we we need to shift from these discussions because it's been 25 years talking about climate change and that's the and things are still getting worse so i think what, what it, it is a very valid point about issues of negotiations, but I feel like for, for, for my stand, negotiations should come to complement the work that we are already doing. So I think it begins with us, even issues of climate financing, it begins with you and me. So if, if, if you're going to get some resources from, from, from basically the negotiations, personal on our own, own personal account, we should be able to get something from out of our budget. So that is where we bring in the aspect of green economy. But I don't want to drive that further. So I'll hand over to Maria to see if we have any any questions, uh, maybe from, yes. Uh, I can see Emily uh, has sent, uh, yes, no. yes. Ma Maria, Maria. Yeah, so just just a question from Emily Lim that is that says COVID-19 has caused economies to suffer. Do you see governments shifting their agenda to prioritize spending to revive their economies instead? I think she means instead of climate action. And how will this impact how will this impact climate finance agencies? Can I call in? So um, if any of the speakers want to jump in and, and answer this question. Yeah. Can I come in? Can I come in? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. OK. So um, very, very, very important, very, very important question. You know, that's why when you hear a lot of uh, developed nations that talk about not just recovery from COVID, but they call it the green recovery, right? So a lot of also say not just being COVID resilient, but also being climate and COVID resilient. So, so first of all, let's look at what the challenges are. There, there are issues with food security, right? And climate change really threatens food security, right? Because of flood, of drought, and all these things. So for us to be able to ensure that people get the food they need to eat, we have to ensure that uh, climate action is, 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 is integral in our agricultural finance particularly from the bank, commercial bank side. So what I continue to tell, the, tell commercial banks in Nigeria and also in Ghana is that when you're funding, for example, an agricultural project, ask yourself the question, is that project climate resilient? What is, what are you, is that project going to be rain fed in terms of food production? How do you store that? Um, how do you store the produce? You know, that kind of conversation is also what we have with banks. And the government really has no other choice but to go climate finance in recovery, in recovery from this COVID-19. Because, because the money that needs to be spent needs to be spent on local manufacturing. So we're saying that when government is supporting the real sector in local manufacturing, we should ensure that energy efficiency is integral in doing so. You know, when government is looking at energy inclusion, it should be renewable energy. So you're saying that whatever the money that is going into the economy to revive the economy, 
the money should go towards climate action and activities to support the existing sectors. So we can use the money to fund the same um, um, unfriendly, uh, environmentally unfriendly activities. Not anymore. We can't afford to waste this moment to reset our economy and do things right. Those are actually very valid points, Jibril. And I, I like I like the aspect of, of, of you driving towards economy and how resources uh, mobilized for for, 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 for for COVID should also be used, you know, for to address issues of climate change. I think from, from why I seem to just to, to, to agree with what you've said is that uh, the, the amount of effort and, and the amount of, how do I say, zeal that we've seen our governments put in mobilizing resources for issues of COVID-19 should be the same amount of momentum that they should put towards addressing issues of climate change. So I think that's a very great Let point because... Yes, well, yeah. when you look at when you look at issue, yeah. when you look at in in, in term of of, the, of our countries, basically, I can speak from 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 where I'm stationed, basically in Kenya. You'd find that there are areas where we we had so much floods that the issue of COVID nineteen became a non issue, and the issue of floods was now the more issue. More people died have died in Kenya because of floods, which is caused by climate change. Due to, that has led to yeah. the heavy, heavy rainfall than than people who died from COVID nineteen. So it's it it feels like in as much as COVID nineteen is, is a global pandemic, to me it feels like climate change is even a bigger pandemic because when it comes to issue issues of climate change, they will they will how do I say they will curtail intervention measures for 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 other other issues that may arise in the future. So in as much as we know and we are confident with, with, with our research and medics that we are going to win the war against COVID-19, but we, we, we are not so sure about mm -hmm. winning the war of, of climate change and issues of climate finance are very crucial. So I, for, for me, I feel like we, we, we need to use that same zeal and resources and, and zeal all across the board to mobilize even if it's global resources for climate finance so the 100 billion us dollars should not be an issue because if we could mobilize money for covid 19 then we should be able to mobilize this 100 billion that was pushed in <laughs> so i think with that i like absolutely to hand over yes 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 i'd like to hand over to maria if there's anything um yeah i think you put it really well um, so I feel like we're, we're, we're rounding up to the close of the session, but I wanted to give an opportunity to the speakers if they have questions for each other to ask the questions now, um, if there are any, if you would like to direct a question to any one of the speakers. Okay, it's okay. Do, do, do you want to ask a question? Yes, just a, a question. I'm sorry, I've talked too much during this session. To, to each and every one of you, uh, how, in, in summary, how would you say, uh, how, how would you say the COVID 19 has affected your work? Uh, in relation to what you do on issues of climate financing, on a, on or on a personal, how how has it affected uh, how, what you do in regards to climate change? Yes. Uh, I can start. Um, okay, so on our end, we've seen that a lot of people for. Um, and related to the to the campaign my money my plan then the movement um when COVID started it was uh, very difficult to talk about something else than COVID to people um and so that because COVID was just taking a lot of people's mind space um and people were very preoccupied by that topic uh, but then when people were just in in lockdown in their countries then they were very interested in also getting a deep dive onto 
um, what can I, how can I change my habits? How can I adapt to the new normal? And they also looked at finance for it. And so that was, that was great for the campaign to, um, to have a bit of a, um, um, like a, a, a higher a trend, if I may say. Um, and so COVID had a positive and negative impact on our work, I would say. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, we we have Eduardo and, and Jibril. And yes, yeah, so we can start with Jibril, I think, is first. Eduardo, kindly allow me to give the floor to Jibril, then I'll come back to you, if it's possible. All right, no, thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So, thank you so much. Just my own close remark is that uh, in terms of COVID impact, absolutely, particularly in the very, in the days of COVID, it was something that we did not expect. So a lot of our partners had to really step back to look how, how the damage, how far the, how far and how deep the, the damage will be. But now a lot of conversation now is about recovery. And everybody knows that there's going to be a new normal. The new normal that has been discussed now is about green recovery, you know. So, and that has also put climate finance in that um, limelight. We're going to be discussing the recovery after the green, the recovery after the climate finance. You know, so that, that has been the positive uh, impact that COVID has had on the climate finance conversation. Uh, and, uh, and the fact that the UK and the European, European zone, they've been, they've also really, really very, um, they've been a decisive uh, move to say it has to be a green recovery. A lot of money has been set aside to stimulate the economy in a green um, way. You know, and I believe um, Africa too has a lot of on that. And those two end with this note, going back to what the French said about um, able to attract international money. Now, as an investor, personally as well, before we invest in any business, the first question we ask that entrepreneur is that how far, how well have you used their own money? You know, that's the question we will ask yourself. So Africa needs to quickly mobilize their own capital, their own funds, to demonstrate to the international community that, yes, we know what it means to be climate action ready. We know what it means to deploy climate finance capital and are ready to take your own money so that we can expand the scope and the impact that we want to achieve. You know, once that we can achieve that in two years, that's also a fantastic achievement for Africa because what, 23, 23, $23 trillion is what is needed for Africa to achieve the Paris Agreement by 2030. We don't have that money in Africa, but we have the money to demonstrate to the, big, to the developed nation that will give us most of the money in two years that we know what to do with the money when, when the money comes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jibril. I can't find Eduardo, uh, but uh, maybe we can open the floor to any of our speakers. Maureen, if you'd like to say something. Well, um, most of the things that I was thinking about is what Diane said. Like um, during this period for almost like a hundred days now, uh, it's very hard to make people listen to any other things. It's very hard to convince someone to focus on any other thing than their own than their own health. So, like I totally, I'm totally one hundred percent agreeing with what Diana said that it's been it's been a very trying period, mostly when it comes to trying to raise awareness on other stuff, and also. But then it's been a very good. Uh, with the climate finance, personally, I think it's been on our favor so much because now um, we have lived to what we were we were we have lived to what we were thinking that it could happen in the future in terms of um, in terms of having in terms of we um, let's say in terms of we're trying to save some species we're trying to save some plants through climate finance and mostly during this period probably dolphin you do know this that in in Gibraltar, in most parts in africa we've been using plants that were there but then now that this has come through people will probably be more aware that after 
did, when now that we're coping with the new normal, people will be more aware and more conscious that this climate finance is something that to actually take serious off because guess what? Um, just a small mistake and let's say another pandemic happened, we might not have the we not, might not have the things that we need to cure ourselves, right? And also like uh, when I'm um, just going to address the other question before, when it comes to government shifting their their focus now when it comes to raising their economies, I feel like governments should also consider that climate finance is also part of them raising their economy in terms of uh, let's say for let's say for Tanzania we mostly depend on agriculture. So the government should not only focus on maybe industrial perspectives, but they should also focus on climate finance in terms of we as a country we do need that that constant climate, a climate that we're going to we're the a climate that is going to help us grow our crops that eventually will help us increase our economy, right? Yeah, so I totally agree with Diana, and that's uh, that's one thing I actually wanted to add from the previous question that governments should not only think of the economy, but should also think of the re technically climate is the reason the economy is where it is. In most countries, mostly the ones that um, depend on fishing and agriculture, so they should put an eye on that too, and they, sh they should not leave us behind, basically. Thank you for this. I'll hand over to Maria. Maria, we can't hear you, Maria. Perhaps, perhaps Eduardo can answer the question now that he's back. Hi, what's the question? Sorry, uh, my connection broke down. I apologize. The, it, it's okay. The, the question was about how you've been handling, how your work has been affected and how you've been able to work under COVID-19. Ah, uh, well, the idea that I wanted to tell you that this is a great opportunity. When we did the 12 simulations uh, in April and May, uh, people from 20 countries participated. People from Spain, people from Italy, people from Canada, Canada, from the US, from Belgium, uh, people from Colombia, people from Mexico, people from uh, Guatemala, people from uh, Chile, uh, and also Bolivia. So 20 countries in, in, in total. And this is something very massive. So if you would do, want to do a climate change awareness events, and you can reach anyone in the world now, but that last year that was impossible. I had to travel to Brazil to train facilitators. I had to travel to uh, Bogota in Colombia to train people. But now you can reach anyone in the world. And this is a great opportunity to do climate change awareness. And I thank you so much for, now I'm speaking with yeah. people that are in Africa. So that's great. It's nothing, I, I, I never thought about doing that <laughs> in my life. <laughs> and so it's gotten, it's a great opportunity to be in, in this uh, virtual world. That's what I tried, that was my, uh, my idea, my, uh, the thing I wanted to share. So thank you so much. Uh, Maria? Uh, yeah, thank, sorry. Thank you, thank you, Eduardo, for answering that. And I think um, that kind of summarizes exactly why we're all doing this. Um, maybe I'll just share one of uh, the last questions we have from our very interactive audience, um, which is, this is from Eric, and he's saying that not all have been doomed about COVID-19. We have witnessed less air pollution and climate change has scored big here. I think, Eric, I'm not sure which country you're in, and um, how might we maintain these small rooms post-COVID? So he's asking, how can we continue the progress that we are making 
after the pandemic has worn off? Well, I have an idea I can share it. When you use renewables, mostly you don't have a direct cost. So which energy sources are you going to use? Those that don't have a direct cost. And that's it's, uh, going greener. And that is the great advantage of, of many of these technologies, that you save money and you save uh, energy and fuel. I think that's a great opportunity. And petroleum has done with negative prices and nobody wants petroleum, so uh, oil. Um, it has been a big, a big crisis for them, and they have to get uh, subsidies from the government too. And unfortunately, all the uh, economy works about fossil fuels in, in uh, at least in my country. So the fossil fuel industry has asked for support from the government that is currently in default. Argentina is in default, uh, so uh, it's very sad that we are in this fault, but I think that this uh, crisis shows the advantages of using clean technology because you use less energy, because you save energy, because it's cheaper in the long run. I don't, uh, I, that's all I can say. If, if, if you... Okay. Thank you so much. I, yeah. I, I, I hope it has been understood. Yes, it has been understood. And, and uh, I just want yeah. to thank everyone, all of you yeah. lovely speakers for, for, for expressing your opinions and sharing with us uh, some of the lessons you've learned, but also the knowledge that you have um, with our audience. And with that, I, I just want to close on a very, um, light-hearted and happy note, which is to say that um, I think one of the things that I've learned from this session is we should all continue networking with each other and using the tools we have, and that we should also not forget about translating the action on the ground, even though we are talking a lot about policy, but how are we financing it? How are we translating this into tangible things that we can see in our communities? Um, and so with that, I'll, I will hand over to Dolphin to say the closing remarks. Uh, I'd like to take, first of all, take this opportunity to thank all our speakers for showing up and agreeing to, to, to be part of this very fruitful discussion. I know uh, it was a bit of a cup because of a short time notice, but it, it's because of technology, this has been made easier. And because of COVID, one thing must appreciate COVID, we, 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 it has better to, better to be able to appreciate the use of technology more, especially in issues of fighting climate change and climate change advocacy in general. So I think for me, uh, I'd also like to thank our viewers who are out there. I know uh, yeah, there, there are a lot of people streaming in and they're following through. And uh, we just like to inform them uh, this series, this is we're, we're supposed to run it uh, a couple of series, so this is just the first series. Uh, the next series will be in a couple of weeks' time. Also, we'll be de digging deeper into issues of climate finance and climate change. So this was um, a bit of, of our soft launch of what, uh, of what, of course, uh, we want to do. And from this, we'll be able to build momentum onto other series that uh, we're looking to run to the long-term thing. So uh, we invite youth from across uh, the globe, across Africa, across other continents, to be part and parcel of this. We, we invite youth organizations to be part of all of this. And yeah, so, and we, for me, I would like to urge all stakeholders, especially the governments, because I know uh, how, how important it is to work uh, with, with our governments uh, to, to continue working we, with young people on issues of climate change and climate finance and also the civil society organizations to continue capacity building young people and engaging them on such issues and everyone across board not to forget the private sector of course uh so i think with that i'd like to uh declare uh this uh webinar officially closed and uh ladies and gentlemen uh we look forward to more fruitful and deeper engagements on climate finance issues. Okay, thank you so much, Dolphin and Maria. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you. Uh, Bye. Take care. Goodbye. Bye-bye.
Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. <laughs>